By college football standards, the rivalry between the University of Texas and Texas A&M is exactly what you would expect. First played in 1894 and scheduled annually starting in 1915, the Longhorns and Aggies feature all the standard tropes. UT is the liberal arts university in the urban state capital. The snobs. A&M is the agriculture and military and engineering school. The country folk, let's say. Both schools boast an official dislike of one another in their respective fight songs. Both schools built annual game week traditions on campus before playing each other, usually around Thanksgiving at the end of the regular season. Sometimes this rivalry is streaky. Texas holds a significant lead, but A&M dominated in the 1980s and early 90s. And hey, there's been some amazing moments, like when A&M rallied to win after the bonfire tragedy, or when Texas's Ricky Williams broke Tony Dorsett's all-time rushing record against the Aggies. If all this feels pretty normal, the preppies versus the hicks and the traditions and, well, that's because it is, except for one small detail. Both of these schools are rich, really rich, stupid rich. It's Texas after all, and there's no shortage of billionaires, plural, funding on-field aspirations and funneling off-field slush funds. Off the field and in the ledgers is where the hatred between these two groups becomes one of one and a rivalry heats up into a Texas side of beef. This episode of Beef History is brought to you by Modelo, the mark of a fighter. Both the Aggies and Longhorns became charter members of the Big 12 Conference in 1996 when members of the Southwest and Big 8 Conferences merged. At the time, historic little brother A&M was the better program, but over time, Texas surpassed them, culminating in their 2006 National Championship win. Texas had a long history of ruling over their conference mates, especially the schools in Texas, like a tyrant. About 100 years prior, Texas cut off their game with A&M and held up their admission into the newly forming Southwest Conference because they felt Aggies head coach Charlie Moran was using illegal players, or ringers. He was also beating Texas a lot on the field. A&M needed the Texas game to make money, so they relented, and they fired Moran. Back in the modern era, the Horns still weren't interested in equal representation in the league. They had more fans, more resources, and way, way more billionaire donors shoveling money into their athletic department than their peers. Texas expected to be in charge. Thanks in no small part to Texas's behavior, Big 12 member Nebraska announced in 2010 that it would leave the league and join the Big 10. Soon after, Colorado announced that it would accept an invitation to the expanding Pac-12 conference. Suddenly, the Big 12 conference was in rough shape. Now imagine your Texas A&M. Thanks to their connections in the energy sector alone, the Aggies can boast deeper pockets than almost all of college football, except for their hated rival. Complicating this dynamic is a long-held, hard-to-argue theory that Texas controlled things, both in the state legislature, they're located in the same place, and in the Big 12 Conference. Then, in 2011, Texas shocked the world by announcing the Longhorn Network, a 24-7, all-University of Texas cable network with ESPN, with all of its revenue going to Texas. It was an unexpected move with devastating consequences for the Longhorn's neighbors. At the time, television money was flooding into college sports at the same level as professional leagues, and college conferences began to negotiate highly lucrative deals. But conferences, though, a group of 10 to 14 schools who would negotiate as a unit to receive a giant payday that they would split equally. Not one single school, no matter how big that school. No one in college sports would have even considered a project with that much hubris, except Texas. To push the Longhorn Network through, Texas first flirted with joining the Pac-10 Conference, but that league was forming its own TV network, which meant Texas wouldn't have an LHN if they went west. So, by lording the Pac-10's invite over a panicking Big 12 membership group, the Big 12 consented to Texas's one-team solo revenue league, even though it worked directly against the greater good of the conference. The revenue structure for LHN went solely to Texas, and LHN's existence killed the chances for any kind of Big 12 network that would have benefited all of its members equally. Texas's rivals raised a ton of concerns. UT was planning on showing high school games live on LHN, giving them a huge advantage over their rivals in recruiting, especially other schools in the state, like A&M. ESPN also wanted Big 12 conference games on LHN, meaning fans of Texas's rivals, like A&M, would have to subscribe to LHN and thus give Texas their money to see their teams play. 
Frustrated with Texas and eager to build something outside of their rival shadow for once, Texas A&M had considered leaving the league before, but the ability for Texas to direct an entire cable channel at recruits and hoard TV money was a bridge too far. So, Texas A&M headed east to the Southeastern Conference, where they stood to make a substantial amount of money as an equal partner in that league's robust television rights deal with ESPN and CBS. More importantly, on the field, they'd be joining the SEC, college football's most successful conference, as the league's westernmost team and its only team in Texas. This was A&M's chance to break away and redefine themselves. But this also meant that Texas and A&M, storied in-state rivals playing in a series that dated back over a century, wouldn't meet annually unless the pair would agree to schedule each other as an out-of-conference opponent. Now, this isn't uncommon at all. Lots of schools from the same state but different conferences schedule each other every season to preserve their rivalry. But you have to want to do that, and Texas just seemed to be out. Suddenly, the off-field financial interests of these schools had created a mindset heretofore unseen even in the most corrupt of college football circles. That the act of playing a football game against your rival was somehow prohibitive to your own success. In 2011, Texas A&M and Texas met for the final time in a classic that became their formal send-off. Aggies quarterback Ryan Tannehill threw the go-ahead touchdown with a minute 48 remaining, and A&M led 25-24. But a personal foul penalty against A&M and a scramble by Texas quarterback Case McCoy set up a game-winning walk-off field goal for the Horns. That penalty was against A&M safety Trent Hunter, who called the game, quote, by far the most painful loss I've had since I've been here. It's one of those things that we're going to have to live with for a while since Texas and Texas A&M aren't playing again. Meanwhile, Texas kicker Justin Tucker told reporters that, quote, sending them off to the SEC with a sour taste in their mouth feels pretty good. Those sure seem like comments from rival football teams who want to prove their superiority to one another on a field of play to secure bragging rights, right? But business was the order of the day. Hunter's teammate, A&M receiver Ben Molina, echoed the feelings of exhausted Aggies everywhere. The Texas-Texas A&M rivalry speaks for itself, but we're going to the SEC next year, so we have bigger and better things to worry about. And for the foreseeable future, that was that. Except that these obvious rival schools would spend the next decade constantly saying that they weren't thinking about each other, while their fans, players, and everyone who loved college football were screaming at them for the teams to play. A&M replaced Texas with LSU for its end-of-season rivalry game, and Texas did the same, swapping in TCU for the Aggies. In 2012, Texas defensive end Alex Okafor told the media, I feel sorry for A&M. We still have a big time game on Thanksgiving, they're missing out. In January of 2013, a proposal forcing the two teams to play was introduced in the Texas legislature, but it died off. Two months later, Texas AD DeLos Dodds claimed that A&M and not Texas was the reason the game wasn't being played. Throughout 2013, multiple A&M leaders said the series wouldn't resume, including Texas A&M president R. Bowen Lofton, who boldly declared, that the rivalry is not relevant to us anymore. It's not an important issue. The following year, Dodds was replaced at Texas by new athletic director Steve Patterson, who flatly declared the rivalry to be, quote, dead. Certainly, the rivalry wasn't happening in the toe-meets-leather sense, but it was far from dead just because the people who make college sports said it was. If anything, it was kept alive in the following years by the people who actually make college sports, the fans, the players, the coaches, all of whom refused to hide their desire to see these teams play football. In 2013, an Aggie player tweeted that A&M is, quote, the University of Texas, which prompted Texas head coach Mack Brown to publicly fire back, We are the university in this state, regardless of what some kid tweets. Sure doesn't feel like a dead rivalry. Neither did it when Texas A&M made fun of Texas selling beer at home games. Or the time Aggies assistant coach Tim Brewster bragged on the quality of SEC football over the Big 12, and Texas quarterback Sam Ellinger retweeted the comment telling Alabama's Heisman QB to stop letting A&M, quote, ride on your back. And hey, is that A&M's chancellor making fun of LHN by calling the SEC network, quote, real TV? Man, it sure seems like these two groups view themselves as competitors, rivals, one might say. 
Both universities changed head coaches following the split, and both Charlie Strong at Texas and Kevin Sumlin at A&M expressed their willingness to play and an expectation that somehow the series would return, despite the massive effort above them to act like it didn't matter at all. In fact, when Strong was asked about his then-struggling Horns roster playing A&M in 2015, he accidentally created a popular t-shirt in College Station with his answer. And so it went. Even as the faces and the names changed, coaches kept getting asked when the game would return. They'd respond that they'd like to do it, and then administrators would shoot it down. So why wouldn't these schools just play each other? We've established it's possible despite different conferences, but it's because there's a real anger and a fear in Texas of somehow helping the other team just by recognizing that they exist. It's the dumbest of moves, and it's classic college football leadership brain. The dissonance between the two schools' stances and their actual fans became a political talking point in the state of Texas. In 2017, former A&M Athletic Director Bill Byrne publicly claimed that Texas conspired to block A&M from playing them and any Texas team because of their move to the SEC. But as time went on, public reaction moved away from the why and just heavily towards the win. That year, new governor Greg Abbott, a Texas graduate, announced his intent to reunite the series in a speech. Slowly, the positions at each school changed to reflect the PR of not being a stick in the mud. By 2019, both schools installed new presidents who were publicly in favor of reuniting the game, but without any specific plan. Then, just like how it began, Texas threw its weight around and changed the college football landscape again. In 2021, UT and Oklahoma announced that they too would join the SEC in 2024 as equal revenue sharing partners, inadvertently reuniting Texas with not rival, rival Texas A&M, and also killing the now failed experiment that was the Longhorn Network. Not playing each other for years changed nothing for these programs. A&M jumped to the SEC and made a lot more money, but as of the 2022 season, they've been unable to shed their perception as a really, really expensive also ran in college football. Texas stuck around the Big 12, but struggled to build national title contenders through a rotation of head coaches, despite enjoying their network and all the money they could ask for. Money did nothing to change anything here. It stopped something, but it didn't change anything. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and check out these other college football secret base videos.